13.75 billion years ago, the universe began. Why, we don't know. 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's a very precise number. You might say, how do you know that? Well, before that time, the universe was so hot that atoms couldn't form. So you had a soup of electrically charged particles. It was just too hot for electrons to go into orbit around nuclei. So the universe was opaque to light. So you just couldn't... It was like one, almost like a big glowing star, if you like. Imagine if I told you that our universe has been around forever, even before the Big Bang. It might sound pretty wild, right? Well, hold on to your hats, because renowned physicist Brian Cox is on board with this mind-bending idea. It's interesting, this idea of the Big Bang created the universe. That's what Einstein's theory says. That's textbook cosmology, if you like. But the current textbook picture is there was a, a phase in the universe's life before the Big Bang, if you define the Big Bang as the hot, dense phase from which the universe appeared to sort of burst for 13.8 billion years ago. And that phase is called inflation. So what we think happened is that before that, the universe was accelerating exponentially fast. It means it was doubling and doubling and doubling in size. And the numbers are ridiculous. We think that if you started with a universe that was smaller than a single atom, then it would be bigger by a long way than the whole observable universe, 350 billion galaxies in it, in less than a million, 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 millionths of a second. So very rapid, exponentially fast expansion. And when that stopped, all the energy that was driving that expansion got dumped into space, it heated it up, it produced the particles of matter out of which we are made and all the things that we see out there in the sky, and that's what we see as the Big Bang. So that sounds fanciful, but that's standard cosmology at the moment. The big question then is, well, what started the inflation? What stopped the inflation? How long did the inflation go on for? And the answer to that is, we're not sure. We don't know. There are theories now that suggest, as I mentioned, that there may be more than one universe and potentially an infinite number. It's a mind-boggling idea, isn't it? And I should say one extra thing. If that's true, then some of those theories say that what we call the constants of nature, so things like the strength of gravity, the speed of light, the masses of the particles, can vary from universe to universe. And then you ask the question, well, why is our universe so perfect for life? Why do stars make carbon and oxygen the elements that you need for life? Why is everything so beautifully balanced so that living things can exist? The answer in these cases is because, well, every universe exists. Every possible combination of the laws of nature exists in different universes. So the reason we, obviously the reason we, we have to see a universe that allows us to exist, obviously, we could ask the question, well, how likely is that? Well, the answer, there are an infinite number of them, is it's inevitable because there's every possible kind of universe. And I stress that this is very speculative stuff, but the first thing I said is about inflation, the idea that there's this exponentially fast expansion before the Big Bang, if you want to use that language. That's not speculative, that's mainstream cosmology. But this idea that that may lead to multiple universes is more speculative, but it's still scientifically valid and there are people who do research into that. And again, this is an active area of research. It all stems from a theory put forward by none other than Sir Roger Penrose, who suggests that our universe is just one in a whole cosmic lineup. Penrose's theory shakes up our understanding of time and space by proposing that there might have been universes before ours, all part of an endless cycle of creation and destruction. Picture it, countless universes popping into existence over unimaginable stretches of time. It's not about infinity with no beginning or end, but rather a series of beginnings and endings. So what does this mean for our grasp of reality? Could it be that time itself doesn't have a beginning or end? It's a mind-bending notion, but one that's worth exploring. So let's dive in and see where this rabbit hole leads. In scientific circles, Sir Roger Penrose is esteemed as a brilliant mind, with a reputation in the UK comparable to that of the late astrophysics luminary Stephen Hawking. Penrose holds a Nobel Prize and was knighted by the British Queen for her scientific achievements. One of his most controversial theories is conformal cyclic cosmology, which suggests that our universe may have originated from a previous one. This theory challenges conventional notions of time and space. 
Recently, the James Webb Telescope provided new support for CCC, with discoveries that contradict traditional cosmology. Let's delve into the surprises revealed by the James Webb Telescope and what they imply for Roger Penrose's CCC cosmology. Alongside the 16 galaxies that existed so early in the universe that they must precede the Big Bang, six black holes also emerged, exhibiting similar characteristics. Just a few hundred million years post-Big Bang, these colossal entities already surpassed one billion solar masses. Then, a scientific revelation shattered existing explanations. The discovery challenges previous notions about the Big Bang's timeline. While not as ancient as other findings by James Webb, this galaxy, nearly identical to the Milky Way, raises questions about established theories. Although galactic resemblances are not uncommon, it took billions of years for our Milky Way to evolve into a fully formed spiral galaxy. This newfound galaxy existed approximately 2 billion years post-Big Bang. Assuming galaxies like this one require billions of years to develop, their age stretches beyond the Big Bang. This presents a unique advantage compared to James Webb's other discoveries. Because of its proximity, analyzing the light of this galaxy is somewhat easier compared to the even older galaxies spotted by Webb. The data regarding the number of stars, their compositions, and the formations within this galaxy are more reliable. They indicate that this galaxy exhibited a level of maturity similar to our Milky Way only billions of years after the Big Bang. Have you ever pondered the idea that our Milky Way also existed in some form during the early universe? It could have been a small, irregular globular cluster at that time. Or perhaps our Milky Way is much older than previously believed and was already traversing space as a fully formed galaxy some 13 billion years ago. With an estimated stellar mass of approximately 3.9 billion solar masses, it's considerably larger than expected for galaxies of that age, although still relatively small compared to the Milky Way. However, the primary question regarding the evolution of galaxies in the early universe revolves less around mass and more around shape. The shapes of galaxies are believed to evolve through intricate merging and growth processes spanning billions of years. How does this recent discovery lend support to Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology? According to CCC, the universe didn't begin with a traditional Big Bang concept, but emerged from a previous universe, with all information about matter, stars, and galaxies already existing. Despite this, each new universe in CCC still starts with an event akin to a Big Bang. Previous cosmologies struggled to explain what came before the Big Bang. Classical physicists claimed nothing happened, while quantum physics proposed a quantum tapestry of equilibrium. However, the origin of this quantum fluctuation remained unexplained until Penrose's idea offered some insights. The CCC is highly complex, so here's a simplified overview. Picture a universe much like ours, where massive black holes consume all matter. Eventually, as the last star and grain of dust vanish into these behemoths, physical forces halt. This initiates a chain reaction akin to the universe's demise. For a brief period beyond our time frame, the universe reaches complete equilibrium, devoid of measurable forces or matter. Only the black holes may persist or evaporate in this transition from death to renewal. Eventually, a new universe emerges from what we might call a spark of life, or more scientifically, a law of cyclicity. This kickstarts the creation process anew. Penrose's theory suggests that the universe's properties at its end closely resemble those at the beginning of a new era. He developed the CCC concept while exploring the core aspects of general relativity and quantum mechanics. To this day, the two disciplines remain considered incompatible. Penrose sought both points of contact and contradictions between them. In his exploration, he observed the significance of singularities and the characteristics of the cosmic microwave background. He noted that the thermodynamic time direction of the universe, as dictated by the second law of thermodynamics, could hint at a large-scale structure. Penrose posited that the universe likely originated in a state of very low entropy, indicated by the smooth and ordered state of the cosmic microwave background. Central to the conformal cyclic cosmology are the Hawking points, tiny regions within the cosmic microwave background that could be remnants of black holes from previous universe cycles. According to this model, these primordial black holes would have existed in earlier universe epochs and subsequently evaporated through radiation, leaving behind observable traces in subsequent cycles of the universe. Another interpretation suggests that black holes managed to survive the transition from one universe to another. 
This perspective sheds light on why the discovery of ultramassive black holes near the Big Bang lends support to Penrose's theory. If information regarding stars, galaxies, and matter formation seamlessly transferred from an old universe to a new one, it's plausible that the evolution of matter and galaxies occurred at an accelerated pace. If the CCC theory holds true, it would establish a completely new starting point, prompting questions about the true nature of time and space. This notion aligns with the concept of the cyclicity of the universe, which serves as a coherent subset of eternal inflation and the multiverse theory. Naturally, this also prompts inquiries into the fundamental characteristics of time and space, the theory of eternal inflation traces its roots back to the contributions of physicists such as Alan Guth and Andre Lind. Inflation is a prequel uh, to the conventional Big Bang picture. Uh, it provides a story that precedes uh, the expansion of the universe, the formation of galaxies, etc., cetera, uh, etc. Cetera. So the way in which inflation explains the bang. Uh, is in terms of a very surprising feature of physics, I think very surprising to most of us, uh, which is the fact that gravity can actually sometimes act repulsively. Uh, now, those of us who learned about gravity in high school and learned Newton's law of gravity probably think this sounds crazy, uh, because Newton's law of gravity is purely an attractive law of gravity. Uh, but that got changed with the advent of Einstein's theory of gravity, uh, which is the theory called general relativity. Uh, according to general relativity, uh, gravity normally acts attractively, but there are circumstances under which it can act repulsively. Uh, and furthermore, modern particle physics uh, very strongly indicates that at very high energies, we expect uh, there to exist the kind of states of matter uh, that would produce the repuls repulsive form of gravity uh, that general relativity allows. Uh, and inflation is basically the proposal that the bang of the Big Bang, the driving force behind the expansion, was this repulsive gravity uh, as allowed by general relativity. Once you decide that this mechanism of propulsion is very likely the way our universe was born, you can ask what kind of universe does it predict and does it agree with what we see. Uh, and in fact, it, 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 it under, allows us to understand three very important properties of our universe. Uh, one is it allows us to understand the uniformity of our universe. Uh, as I think was already mentioned, this cosmic background radiation that has been now measured with incredible precision uh, has fluctuations, which are incredibly interesting, and we'll be talking about them tonight. Uh, but these fluctuations are incredibly tiny. They're only at the level of one part in 100,000. Uh, to an accuracy of one part in 100,000, the cosmic background radiation that we see is the same intensity in every direction that we look. The universe is just unbelievably uniform on large scales. And that cannot be understood in the conventional Big Bang picture. Uh, but inflation explains it very naturally. You start with a very small universe, which becomes uniform before inflation, and then inflation just takes over and magnifies this tiny uniform speck to become large enough to include everything that we observe. In the 1980s, two researchers uncovered that following the Big Bang, a small portion of space experienced rapid expansion driven by a phenomenon called inflation. This inflationary period smoothed out initial irregularities, giving rise to the observable universe. However, the theory of eternal inflation suggests that this process never entirely ceases. In certain regions of space, inflation halts, forming bubble universes, while in others it persists, potentially generating an infinite array of universes. This concept leads to the notion of a multiverse, encompassing countless universes with varying physical laws and constants. Within this new framework, there could be further inflation occurring. The bubbles expand, contributing to the growth of the multiverse, where universes interact and inflation decelerates. Overall, the multiverse is depicted as a realm of continuous evolution and creation. Amidst these processes, the concept of a cyclical universe emerges, emphasizing constant renewal and expansion rather than a definitive beginning and an end. Only on much larger scales. You can picture it like on Earth. Earth is now our multiverse, teeming with billions of people, countless animals, plants, and diverse habitats. Within this vast expanse, individuals, animals, and seasons come and go, yet new life is continually emerging, making this world a vibrant expression of existence and growth. The concept of eternal inflation and the multiverse fundamentally alters our understanding of time and space. In the theory of relativity, Time and space are viewed as components of a four-dimensional continuum influenced by the presence of mass and energy. 
While we've derived many scientific principles from this framework, we may have overlooked crucial aspects, leading us to the limits of our current tools. Will we discover the elusive theory that Albert Einstein tirelessly pursued throughout his life? The singular equation that encompasses everything the universe comprises, its origins and its mechanisms. Despite Einstein's efforts, this ultimate equation remains elusive. Scientists continue to await the discovery of this mystical formula, often referred to as the unified field formula or simply the field formula. Maybe our mistake lies in focusing on a field too narrow to encapsulate something much broader. Just as we can't describe a tree by examining a single leaf, attempting to reconstruct the entirety of the tree from a leaf's genome in a laboratory might parallel current efforts in particle physics. Scientists aim to glean insights into the overarching mechanisms from the behavior of the tiniest particles. However, this endeavor is only partly successful, as the deeper we delve into the realm of subatomic particles, the more enigmatic our measurements become. Despite peering through telescopes across a vast expanse spanning over 90 billion light years, like James Webb capturing light that has journeyed for more than 13 billion years, we must acknowledge that our observations may be akin to a single grain of sand on a vast beach. What role did black holes play in the universe's formation? And is it possible that they were the universe's inaugural entities? The scientist Neil deGrasse Tyson offers his own intriguing perspective on this matter. According to deGrasse Tyson, we are part of this universe. We are in this universe. But perhaps even more important than these two facts is that the universe is in us. We stand on the brink of uncovering answers to some of humanity's most fundamental questions. Where did the universe originate? Who or what brought it into existence? And do we exist as part of a grand design or merely as a product of chance? Neil deGrasse Tyson, a distinguished astrophysicist and popular science communicator, suggested that the James Webb Telescope has detected indications of black holes from a previous universe. If this assertion proves true, it could imply that our universe is just one in an endless series of cosmic rebirths. Should this hypothesis be confirmed, it would necessitate a re-evaluation of the entire history of cosmology. James Webb challenges our understanding of the universe. What distinguishes a galaxy as a universe breaker? These galaxies earned this title because they seemingly existed shortly after the Big Bang, suggesting an age older than the universe itself. Now, this notion defies logic, indicating a discrepancy somewhere. With the recent discoveries by the James Webb Space Telescope, science embarks on a new frontier. Approximately 20 of these galaxies have been officially confirmed, with their age and distance meticulously verified by independent scientific teams. For the remaining candidates, calculations are ongoing, with the possibility that some may not be galaxies but enormous black holes. One such confirmed black hole, with a mass potentially exceeding 1 billion solar masses, dates back to a mere 500 million years after the Big Bang. This poses a puzzling question. How could a black hole accumulate the mass of over one billion suns in such a relatively short time, especially when previous calculations suggest that only the first stars were forming during this period? Something seems very awry here, leading researchers to seek new explanations for what the Webb telescope is revealing to us. The discrepancies likely stem from the formation of matter and the calculation of the universe's age. How did matter truly originate? Quantum physicists have unearthed that nothing truly exists meaning there couldn't have been anything before the Big Bang. Instead, the state preceding the Big Bang manifested as an absolute balance of all forces. Quants emerged, neutralized one another, and then vanished back into eternity. Then, at some juncture, there was an explosion. A previously unidentified trigger at a minuscule point ensured that a quantum could no longer neutralize itself. This marked the end of absolute equilibrium and the physical zero point, leading to the creation of something. Scientists are convinced that the singular point contained all the information and the fundamental structure of everything observable in the universe today. The Big Bang occurred in a mere fraction of a second, unleashing an astonishingly hot environment filled with quarks and gluons. This primal form is termed quark-gluon plasma by scientists. As the universe expanded and cooled, it went through a series of phase transitions leading to the formation of the first subatomic particles. Approximately a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, Quarks condensed into protons and neutrons, marking the onset of the Hadron era and the beginning of matter. Subsequently, during the Lepton era, electrons were produced as the universe continued to cool. 
about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. During the recombination era, the universe cooled sufficiently for electrons and protons to form stable hydrogen atoms for the first time. This reduced the opacity of the universe, allowing light to travel more freely through space. This event is reflected in the universe today as cosmic background radiation, which has been instrumental in shaping many theories about the universe's origin and evolution. It's considered a precise record of early cosmic events, serving as a valuable map and source of information. Scientists have uncovered clues to the Big Bang and expansion in radiation, and now this radiation may also provide evidence of another universe. Neil deGrasse Tyson's suggestion about the mass of a black hole originating from a previous universe is not without merit. With James Webb's groundbreaking discoveries, the likelihood of this theory becomes increasingly plausible. Let's delve into the origins of matter. After the initial clearing of space, matter's building blocks were evenly distributed. Gravity then began to collect these structures, causing them to condense until the first stars emerged. Previous estimates put the universe's age at 500 million to 1 billion years. However, the James Webb Telescope reveals highly developed galaxies during this period, suggesting an age of several hundred million to a billion years. Could there have been another universe? Initially deemed too far-fetched, Roger Penrose proposed the concept of a cyclical universe in one of his acclaimed books in 2010. His scientific peers were shocked. It was as if a scientist was attempting to apply Eastern reincarnation principles to the cosmos. However, Roger Penrose is no ordinary scientist. He's one of the most brilliant astrophysicists and thinkers of our era. Penrose gained even more recognition following the passing of his equally esteemed colleague and close friend, Stephen Hawking. In his home country, Penrose is just as renowned and beloved as Hawking was, having received a Nobel Prize in 2020 and been knighted by the Queen long ago. These accolades stem from his remarkable contributions to physics and his dedication to making science accessible to all. Penrose authored numerous books and aimed at elucidating complex astrophysical concepts for the general public, participated in programs for children and young adults, and appeared on various BBC science shows. When Penrose asserts something, it carries weight. A few months after initially proposing his idea, he presented a well-supported scientific paper. Penrose demonstrated that within the cosmic microwave background radiation, which has remained nearly unchanged since ancient times, there are indications of black holes that may have existed prior to the Big Bang. So what does this imply? Conformal cyclic cosmology suggests that the universe undergoes an endless cycle of successive phases or eons, with each eon beginning with a Big Bang and concluding with a state akin to a new Big Bang. Penrose contends that the concept we refer to as the Big Bang isn't an entirely new beginning, but rather a transition from one eon to another. According to the theory, this transition allows for the transfer of information into a conformal manner, preserving the spatial structure while altering the scale of time and space. Penrose also points to Hawking points in the cosmic microwave background as evidence. These regions of elevated temperature may be remnants of black holes from previous eons. The theory suggests that black holes can transmit information in the form of radiation across eon transitions, highlighting the cyclical nature of the universe. Regarding the formation of matter, the CCC offers an explanation of how matter structure and distribution change over eons while retaining partial preservation. If the universe undergoes cycles of expansion and collapse, the conditions at the end of one eon could influence the initial conditions for matter formation in the next. This suggests that the distribution of matter's basic components and the formation of stars and galaxies in the early universe were more favorable than previously believed. The fundamental matrix for stars and galaxies may have already existed, allowing the new universe to reassemble them from old structures, significantly shorting the practical construction time. This could explain why ready-made galaxies are already present just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Penrose's theory gains momentum with the discovery of ancient galaxies in black holes, leaving skeptics surprised at the once impossible idea. The CCC might also elucidate the early existence of black holes, suggesting they migrate between eons without significant changes and potentially play a role in the formation of new Big Bangs, akin to midwives. Surprisingly, the Big Bang resembles the double-slit experiment in quantum physics, suggesting matter forms only when measured, implying an observer in the quantum world at the universe's birth. However, how this occurred with virtually nothing present remains a puzzling question. The observer could also be pure consciousness, 
something akin to nothingness, because it remains unmeasured and undescribed. Yet, it exists. Both you and I possess consciousness, which shapes matter. It's conceivable that our universe also possesses consciousness, or perhaps there exists a conscious creator. Furthermore, it's plausible that the universe employs a simple mechanism to automate transitions from one universe to another. At the conclusion of a universe, one or more massive black holes may have absorbed all matter. While Penrose proposed that these black holes would then evaporate, what if they serve as the actual origins or witnesses of new universes? Scientists from the University of Chicago and Princeton University suggest that black holes might serve as the necessary observers to collapse an undefined quantum state, leading to the formation of matter. The unique conditions at the event horizons of black holes could have catalyzed the creation of new universes. Near the event horizon, minimal radiation, named after its discoverer Stephen Hawking, is generated by the quantum entanglement of particles inside the black hole and by a small number of particles escaping the black hole. Here's the real twist. Since these few quanta, found at the periphery of a black hole, theoretically hold all the information of consumed matter, this radiation, combined with observational data, could trigger a measurement that gives rise to a new universe. This notion is especially intriguing, as it addresses the long-standing question of what becomes of all the matter and information swallowed by black holes. It's possible they're merely recycled through radiation, leading to the emergence of a new universe. Now let's shift our attention to the concept of time. The concept of time has puzzled philosophers, scientists, and theologians for centuries. From ancient civilizations to modern-day scholars, the question of whether time has a beginning has been a subject of intense debate. However, recent advancements in cosmology, particularly the conformal cyclic cosmology proposed, present a fascinating perspective that challenges traditional notions of time and its origins. As you know, at the heart of the CCC is the idea of conformal geometry, a mathematical framework that describes the shape of space-time. According to Penrose, the universe goes through successive eons, each characterized by its own Big Bang and subsequent expansion. As the universe expands, matter and radiation gradually dissipate, leading to a state of maximum entropy known as the heat death of the universe. However, instead of culminating in a singular endpoint, CCC proposes that the universe undergoes a conformal rescaling, where space-time itself undergoes a transformation that erases the distinction between the past and the future. In this conformal rescaling, the distant future of one eon becomes the remote past of the next, creating a seamless transition between cosmic epochs. This process effectively eliminates the need for a singular beginning of time, as each eon is connected to its predecessors and successors in an endless cycle of cosmic renewal. From this perspective, time is not a linear progression from past to future, but rather a cyclical phenomenon that perpetually repeats itself. One of the key arguments supporting the idea of timeless origins in CCC is the absence of a space-time singularity at the inception of each eon. In the traditional Big Bang model, the universe emerges from a singularity, a point of infinite density and temperature where the laws of physics break down. However, CCC proposes that the universe begins in a state of low entropy, gradually evolving towards higher entropy over the course of each eon. This absence of a space-time singularity suggests that time may not have a definitive starting point, but instead emerges as a consequence of cosmic evolution. Essentially what happened before the Big Bang, right? you, you have to be careful with the language. So if you define the Big Bang really carefully, as the time when the universe was very hot and very dense. And as I said, you, you can't argue with that because we can see it, <laughs> because we can look out into the sky. Our best theory of how the universe got into that state is that there was a time before that, and it's called inflation. What existed before the Big Bang? This question has always been a challenge for scientists, but now it seems they've found the answer to it. But it has left scientists shocked as Brian Cox revealed that something terrifying existed before the Big Bang. So the idea is the universe was, it was there, in a sense, cold and empty and expanding extremely fast. And that expansion slowed down and stopped. And the, the energy that was driving that expansion got dumped into space, heated it up and made all the particles out of which we're made. And that's what we call the Big Bang. So, what existed before the Big Bang? Why has it left scientists terrified? Let's find out. 
And that theory has a kind of an extension called eternal inflation, which is that the inflation essentially goes on forever. And it just stops in little patches. So you imagine this, this stre the fabric of the universe, space time, stretch, stretch, stretch. And then it slows down and stops in little patches. And each one of those patches is basically a big bang and a universe of which ours is one. So you end up with this sort of picture of a, an infinite fractal universe of, of, of basically an infinite number of big bangs. And that's called the inflationary multiverse. In the vast cosmos, the idea of absolute nothingness seems theoretical rather than real. Even if all energy were removed from the universe, it wouldn't be truly empty. Currently, the universe is full of matter, radiation, antimatter, neutrinos, dark matter, and dark energy. Even without energy, the universe still creates new forms of energy. This phenomenon confuses us. It seems the universe doesn't understand our concept of complete emptiness. If we removed all energy, leaving a void, one might expect the universe to reach absolute zero with no particles. Yes, that's not the case. Even in an empty universe, its expansion would still produce radiation. This extends far into the future or even back to the time before the hot Big Bang. The universe, it appears, never truly becomes void. Given all of this, is it plausible that the universe originated from nothing? We can be certain that something always persists. Even if particles, antiparticles, photons and quanta are removed, empty space remains. If we move away from any mass or energy sources, clear the space of external electric, magnetic and gravitational fields, and prevent photons or gravitational waves from entering, a kind of physical emptiness still exists in this space. Quantum fields endure, and the fundamental constants and laws of physics endure. There is an inherent, finite positive and non-zero value of zero-point energy in that space. This represents the closest approximation to nothing within our universe. While you might envision an even more nothing-like state, it lacks physical reality. No experiment can replicate such a condition. By adhering to scientific principles, we acknowledge that something always exists because true nothingness cannot coexist in our universe. Yet, the question of why remains unanswered by science. Presently, our universe appears far from empty. It's teeming with stars, gas, dust, galaxies, quasars, cosmic rays, and radiation from both starlight and the remnants of the Big Bang. With improved observational tools, we could potentially detect additional signals that we anticipate are present. This encompasses gravitational waves generated by any mass moving through a changing gravitational field, the mysterious signals from the constituents of dark matter, and a broader perspective on black holes, both active and dormant. Aside from those emitting the most radiation, everything we observe occurs in a universe that isn't static but is continuously changing. From a physical standpoint, it's intriguing to comprehend the evolution of our universe on a grand scale. The fabric of our universe, known as space-time, is expanding. This implies that if you position two points far apart in your space-time, the proper distance between those two points, the time it takes for light to traverse between them, and the wavelength of the light traveling from one point to the other, all increase over time. The universe isn't just getting bigger, it's also getting colder as it expands. As light stretches to longer wavelengths, it moves towards lower energies and cooler temperatures. The universe was hotter in the past and will become even colder in the future. During this process, objects with mass or energy in the universe attract each other, forming clusters and creating a vast cosmic network. If you were to somehow remove everything, all matter, all radiation, every bit of energy, what would remain? Essentially, you'd have empty space itself, still expanding, still governed by the laws of physics, and still influenced by quantum fields that fill the universe. This is the closest physical approximation to true nothingness, yet it still adheres to specific physical principles. To a physicist in this reality, removing anything else would create an unrealistic state that no longer reflects the cosmos we inhabit. 
This suggests that dark energy as we currently understand it would still be present in this hypothetical universe devoid of matter. In essence, if every quantum field in the universe were set to its lowest energy state, we would arrive at the zero-point energy of space, where no additional energy could be extracted for mechanical work. In a universe containing dark energy, a cosmological constant, or the zero-point energy of quantum fields, it's plausible that the zero-point energy wouldn't be truly zero. As the universe continues to expand and cool, there will come a time in the distant future when radiation becomes the dominant component, surpassing other forms of matter and radiation, leaving dark energy as the primary influence. However, there's also a period in the universe's history, not in the future, but in the distant past, when something else besides matter and radiation held dominance. During cosmic inflation prior to the hot Big Bang, our universe underwent extremely rapid and constant expansion. Instead of being dominated by matter and radiation, the cosmos was controlled by the field energy of inflation, akin to today's dark energy, but much more potent and expanding at a significantly faster pace. If eternal inflation is accurate, but time remains finite, where might the universe have originated? There must have been a beginning, correct? To address this question thoroughly, let's unravel three commonly conflated concepts and discuss each individually. The hot Big Bang in relation to our universe, the theory of cosmic or cosmological inflation and its role in proceeding and preparing for the Big Bang and the issue of an ultimate beginning or origin for our universe, and why both inflation and the original concept of the Big Bang might not offer a satisfactory solution to this question. In the early 20th century, a significant synthesis took place when four key pieces of information came together. A breakthrough by Alexander Friedman in Einstein's General Relativity, showing that a universe filled uniformly with any form of matter and energy cannot remain static but must either expand or contract. The rate of this expansion or contraction depends on the overall energy density of space. Henrietta Leavitt's observational work established a connection between the period of brightness and dimness of variable stars and their inherent brightness, known as the period-luminosity relation. Observations by Vesto Slipher, measuring the shift in light, either red-shifted or blue-shifted, from our solar system's perspective in spiral and elliptical nebulae, which were later identified as galaxies, indicated that these galaxies were moving away from us at incredibly high speeds. Edwin Hubble, alongside Milton Humerson, identified similar types of variable stars to those identified by Henrietta Leavitt in spiral and elliptical nebulae. This enabled them to gauge the distances to these galaxies and confirm they were beyond our own. These findings, combined with other data, led to the concept of the universe expanding. If the universe expands, it suggests that over time, space itself stretches, causing the matter within it to become less dense. As space expands, radiation like light waves not only becomes less concentrated but also stretches, leading to the universe cooling. If we rewind the clock, the opposite would occur to matter and radiation in the universe. In earlier times, when the universe was younger, it was denser and hotter. If we rewind further, all matter and radiation would have been squeezed into a smaller space, increasing the density of the universe. The light, which stretched due to cosmic expansion when we reverse time, would have had a shorter wavelength, resulting in hotter temperatures. If you envision going back as far as physics permits, you'd reach a singular state where all matter and radiation existed within a single point of infinite density and temperature. The initial idea of the Big Bang Theory resulted in the formation of five key expectations regarding the early universe's hot and dense conditions. These forecasts became the foundation of the Big Bang Theory. The universe ought to demonstrate expansion, as indicated by a distinct redshift distance relationship among extragalactic objects. Initially, the universe should have been relatively uniform, with structures like stars, galaxies and clusters of galaxies gradually forming and evolving over time. In the past, the universe was hotter, preventing the formation of stable neutral atoms. 
This prediction led to the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, which is observable today. In the initial stages of the universe, when it was extremely hot, atomic nuclei couldn't form stably. This led to the creation of light elements such as hydrogen, helium, lithium, and their isotopes. The universe was so hot that neutrinos played a significant role. Recently, this prediction was confirmed, indicating that cosmic neutrinos should have detectable effects on both the large-scale structure and the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. With strong observational evidence supporting these predictions, the Big Bang theory has remained uncontested as the primary explanation for the early universe since the mid-1960s, coinciding with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background. As evidence supporting the hot Big Bang theory grew in the 1960s and 1970s, certain challenges surfaced that the Big Bang alone couldn't resolve. Several observations contradicted the concept of the universe originating from a singular state of incredibly high temperatures and densities. Three of these challenges stand out. Firstly, there's the horizon problem. When we observe different directions, the universe seems to possess uniform temperatures and density throughout. However, since the onset of the hot Big Bang, these regions have never had the opportunity to communicate, exchange information, or achieve thermal equilibrium with one another. This raises the question, how did they evolve to exhibit uniform temperature and conditions across the board? Next, let's consider the issue of flatness. In a universe that's expanding, there's a continual tug of war between the initial expansion pushing things apart and gravitational forces attempting to pull everything back together. Remarkably, in our universe, these opposing forces appear to be perfectly balanced, resulting in a spatially flat universe. The question arises, why did our universe come into existence with these particular characteristics? Moving on, we encounter the monopole or ancient relic dilemma. If the universe underwent extreme temperatures and energy conditions in its early stages, why do we not observe any exotic remnants, such as right-handed neutrinos and magnetic monopoles? Theoretically, these particles should be detectable and still present today. Rather than just taking these conditions as how the universe came to be, which contradicts the scientific method, scientists are looking for a mechanism that would establish and arrange these initial conditions. Alan Guth introduced a solution to these cosmological mysteries in 1980 with a groundbreaking paper. He suggested that an early phase of rapid and continuous expansion, where the universe's energy wasn't spread among matter and radiation particles, but was an intrinsic part of space itself via a field or another mechanism, could solve all three issues regarding the horizon problem. The uniformity of temperature and density throughout the universe is attributed to the past interconnectedness of everything. This connection stretched during the early expansion phase called inflation, resulting in the current conditions observed for the flatness problem. Inflation expanded the universe so much that regardless of its initial state, the visible part now appears uniformly flat. As for the monopole problem, the absence of ancient remnants is explained by inflation preventing the universe from reaching excessively high energies or temperatures. The maximum temperature reached after inflation avoids the formation of these remnants. Inflation not only explains these phenomena, but also presents a compelling alternative to the standard hot Big Bang model. Additionally, a further issue was addressed to demonstrate how a uniform and isotropic early universe could be reinstated after inflation. It became evident that inflation could act as a quantum mechanism for seeding the universe with initial imperfections or the origins of cosmic structure, ultimately leading to the intricate formations we see today. In the 1980s, inflation theory made precise and testable forecasts about the beginnings of cosmic structure that should be detectable in both the cosmic microwave background and the large-scale layout of the universe. These forecasts, crafted decades ago, have been validated by observations spanning from the 1990s to the present day, encompassing an almost, though not entirely, scale-invariant spectrum of imperfections, variations in density and temperature, density irregularities that are entirely adiabatic and not at all isocurvature in essence. 
fluctuations on scales larger than what a signal traveling at the speed of light in an expanding universe could generate, and a maximum temperature limit for the universe during the hot Big Bang, notably smaller than the Planck scale. Because inflation involves a rapid expansion of space rather than culminating in a singularity like the original model for the Big Bang, it presents an alternative depiction of the beginning. Instead of time and space gradually emerging from a single state, inflation proposes a rapid expansion leading to the Big Bang. This raises a fundamental question about the actual beginning of the universe, if such a notion even makes sense within the framework of the hot Big Bang. Without inflation, we could trace back and reach a singular state where the universe's size approaches zero in a finite time. However, inflation complicates this scenario. Its exponential growth makes it challenging to trace back to a singularity size, since reaching a state where the universe had zero size would require an infinite amount of time due to the exponential nature of inflation. Adding to the complexity, the observable evidence for inflation, such as quantum fluctuations leaving imprints on our visible universe, corresponds to just the final 10 to the power of 32 seconds before inflation leads to the hot Big Bang. If we were hoping to delay the start of an earlier grand event, inflation ruins those hopes. There's nothing observable that gives us clues about what, if anything, caused inflation. A fascinating aspect of inflation is called eternal inflation. When exploring how inflation works, almost any model that effectively addresses the issues with the original Big Bang and creates the necessary quantum effects to initiate the universe with imperfections will result in a scenario where, while inflation ends in certain areas like our own, there will be countless more surrounding regions where inflation continues, creating more space that keeps expanding. Essentially, once inflation starts, it wipes out any information about what existed before, and the inflationary state will persist indefinitely into the future. At times, quantum fluctuations, akin to those shaping the universe's structure, cause certain areas where inflation ceases, resulting in a hot Big Bang. However, these regions are far fewer compared to those where inflation persists indefinitely. Notably, no two separate regions with Big Bangs will ever overlap because the expanding universe drives them apart. Despite its appeal, eternal inflation has limitations. It's eternal only into the future, not into the past. In fact, it's been demonstrated that inflationary spacetime doesn't extend into the past infinitely and must have originated from a prior, non-inflationary and possibly singular state. The issue of past time-like incompleteness can't be avoided by considering alternatives like bouncing cosmologies or cyclic cosmologies, as they face similar challenges. However, this doesn't necessarily imply that the universe originated from a singularity. While it could have, it's not a strict necessity. For example, one can envision a space-time resembling the past, where inflation takes place by modeling the universe's expansion rate through a scale factor composed of a growing exponential plus a constant, rather than just a pure growing exponential. In essence, the hot Big Bang, while our most accurate model of the early universe, wasn't its absolute genesis. There's a limit on how far back we can extrapolate the temperature and density of our matter and radiation-filled universe. Prior to the hot Big Bang, there existed a period of cosmic inflation which initiated and led to the hot Big Bang. During inflation, space was saturated with energy, devoid of matter and radiation, and expanded exponentially. However, inflation couldn't have persisted indefinitely and must have emerged from some pre-existing non-inflationary state. Unfortunately, our knowledge of this earlier state is limited aside from knowing many things it couldn't have been. We don't live in a universe where matter drifts in empty space. We live in a universe filled with energy fields that interact to form everything we see. When considering the vastness of emptiness, the endless void and mortality, it's striking how the idea of nothingness can provoke such fear. Did William Shatner, at 90, go on a space journey expecting to find the universe's mysteries, only to realize there was no mystery or grandeur? 
he encountered only death, witnessing a cold, dark, black void unlike any darkness on earth. It was overwhelming and all-encompassing. Yet, in another paradox of nothingness, Shatner wasn't truly observing a void. Rather, he was looking at a vacuum where a lot was happening that he couldn't see. Quantum field theory is one of the most accurate theories in physics, known for predicting the outcomes of many experiments. According to this theory, the universe is not made of matter floating in empty space, but of energy fields that permeate space and interact creating everything we observe, including ourselves. Some physicists describe these fields as fluid-like, similar to water in a pool, while others compare them to a room filled with varying levels of energy, like a field of distributed heat. These fields are constantly moving due to quantum fluctuations. Brief changes in energy similar to ripples in a wave caused by external forces exciting the particles within the field. For example, an electromagnet can cause changes in an electromagnetic field. Even in their lower state, known as the vacuum state, fields remain active. Pairs of positive and negative particles continuously borrow energy from the vacuum, briefly appear, and then disappear, returning the energy. These temporary entities are called virtual particles. When the field is excited or at a higher energy level, it has ripples or waves that produce elementary particles that persist and interact with each other, forming the world we know. The type of particles created depends on the field. Different matter particles are associated with specific types of fermions, such as electrons, upquarks, downquarks, and neutrinos, which are fundamental components of all atoms. These fermions interact through three types of field, electromagnetism involving photons, the strong nuclear force involving gluons, and the weak nuclear force involving W and Z bosons. According to Cambridge theoretical physicist David Tong, Without these force fields, matter particles would drift aimlessly in the universe without interactions or interesting behaviors. Then there's the Higgs field, which Tong compares to molasses spread throughout the universe. The Higgs field gives mass to other particles, stopping them from moving at the speed of light. Tong notes that this comparison is not perfect because it suggests friction, while, in reality, different particles interact with the Higgs field in various ways. All fields, including matter and force fields, exist everywhere but interact differently. Some particles in these fields ignore each other, while others interact, leading to reactions and complex structures. The collaboration of these fields covers everything we understand and observe, along with much that remains unknown and beyond our perception. Oddly, the creation of matter particles is an exception. For instance, an atom forms when there's enough energy in the quark fields to produce quarks that aren't destroyed by antimatter quarks. Though the reason for this is not fully understood, gluons, which are particles related to the strong force, bind with two up quarks and one down quark to form a proton. Gluons then connect protons with neutrons to create a nucleus. Physicists propose that the visible universe consists of remnants that survive the constant creation and destruction of virtual particles. However, the particles making up dark matter are a different issue. Although the universe is full of virtual particles, it doesn't completely negate the idea of nothingness. First, there's the nothingness before the Big Bang, which we don't yet understand. Additionally, this nothingness made up of vast fields of quantum energy seems to produce matter and force, leading to the creation of our world. Physicists are still unsure why some elemental particles persisted after the Big Bang. In his book, A Universe from Nothing, Lawrence Cross, a theoretical physicist and cosmologist, argued that the evidence holds the answer. The inherently unstable nature of nothingness produces elementary particles. There's also the idea that the entire universe might be a large virtual particle. The vacuum genesis hypothesis proposes that the universe began as a large fluctuation in the nothingness that preceded it. Although this hasn't been proven, it's an intriguing concept. 
Ultimately, everything, you, me, the whole universe, amounts to a big bunch of nothingness. Even if you can picture an empty universe, this doesn't match reality. Adhering to the laws of physics is enough to dismiss the idea of a truly empty universe. As long as there is energy within it, even the zero-point energy of the quantum vacuum, there will always be some form of radiation that can't be eliminated. The universe has never been completely empty, and as long as dark energy exists, it never will be. The universe is the way it is, and while we try to understand it as much as we can, we should remain humble in the face of its vast unknowns. My only advice is to embrace the curiosity that drives us to explore, question, and uncover its mysteries. Something strange has happened in the universe, and Brian Cox has warned that the implications are too massive to ignore. The universe, as we know it, began in an incredibly hot and dense state, a singularity that expanded and cooled rapidly, giving rise to the entirety of space, time, matter, and energy. But the ultimate destiny of the universe's continuing expansion remains an unresolved scientific mystery. Scientists are racing against the clock to unravel this mystery, combining innovative mathematical models with experimental data. Despite their progress, the universe continues to defy our understanding, revealing itself to be increasingly complex and strange. And now, the renowned scientist Brian Cox has just issued a warning about a groundbreaking discovery of something strange that's happened in the universe. Let's dive in and unpack this together. One level, it's a tour of the universe in all its terrifying vastness. People tend to get frightened. You can't visualize it. It seems overwhelmingly massive, and we seem overwhelmingly small. To be a, a finite speck in an infinite and potentially eternal universe. But the most shocking revelation is in the sequence about black holes. We have found, uh, through considering and exploring the physics of black holes, that we might all be holograms. Think about the fact that although we are tiny and small and fragile, we might be tremendously valuable. Our universe, which was once an infinitesimal speck, no greater than an atom, is now a vast expanse stretching billions upon billions of light years across. Yet, existing in it is something unique, possibly the most precious planet in the universe. Planet Earth, a blue marble floating in the void of space, the only known location in the universe that sustains life. It is the birthplace of humanity and the reference point of our observation of the cosmos. Concealed within the depths of this cosmos are some of the most enigmatic secrets the universe has withheld from us. The solution to these secrets may have the potential to revolutionize our understanding of the cosmos and expand the boundaries of human knowledge. Astronomers today have captured pictures of stars, galaxies, their collisions, and the nebula clouds to comprehend all that is possible. Then we didn't know of any planets beyond our solar system because we hadn't detected them. So even if we thought, well, we can't be special, we didn't know. And then in the early 1990s, we started being able to detect planets. And now we've detected well over 3,000. We've got missions up there like the Kepler telescope that are just trying to detect planets. So thousands of them. So now the statement is that pretty much every star in the sky will have planets around it, which is remarkable. If you go out, you know, it's a clear night. You go out and look at stars. You can imagine that there will be solar systems around everyone. So that allows us to start thinking how many potentially Earth-like planets might there be in the Milky Way galaxy. And the answer is about 20 billion. What you mean there is a rocky planet, the right distance from its star, possibly, if everything's right, to have liquid water on the surface and so on. In a nice distance from the star, perhaps one in 10 stars. We talk about a thing called a habitable zone. Now in the solar system, there are three planets in the habitable zone. There's Venus, Mars, and Earth. Venus is close to the sun, Mars further away. All of those planets, though, we think had water on the surface. So they all could have been habitable in that sense. And still, you know, we're looking for life on Mars to this day. The Hubble Space Telescope, with over one million images captured, has been a pioneer in our exploration of the cosmos. 
The Kepler Space Observatory has discovered over 4,000 exoplanets, some of which are believed to be similar to Earth and capable of sustaining life. But, as scientists delve deeper into the mysteries of the universe, they're beginning to realize that the truth is far more complex and stranger than they ever imagined. Now, renowned scientist and science educator Brian Cox have recently made a startling revelation of something strange that's happened beyond the edge of the observable universe. But, before we dive into this fascinating revelation, let's provide some important context. Everybody knows that gazing at distant celestial bodies is essentially looking back in time. When you look up at the night sky, you're not actually seeing that star as it exists right now. Rather, you're witnessing the light it emitted many years ago. For all we know, the star could have gone supernova over a century ago, and it may be centuries more before we learn of its demise. The frequent news reports of newly discovered distant stars billions of light years away have contributed to a common misconception, the belief that many of the stars in the night sky may have already perished, unbeknownst to us. The notion is sometimes even propagated in educational settings, but it's not the most likely state of affairs. While it's technically possible, it's exceedingly improbable. When people discuss the night sky, they're typically referring to the approximately 9,000 stars visible to the naked eye from Earth. Although we're observing those stars as they existed in the past, the time lapse is relatively short on a cosmic scale. The stars we see in the night sky are generally the closest to our planet, contained within our own galaxy. On average, these stars are only about a thousand light years away, with the most distant visible star being roughly 16,000 light years away but that outlier is barely discernible. Even considering the average star, a thousand years sounds like a long time. How can we be so confident that all of those stars are still thriving in their respective corners of the galaxy? The lifespan of stars typically ranges from 50 million to 20 billion years, with the most massive blue supergiants living for only around 10 million years, though those are exceptionally rare. If we assume an extremely conservative 50 million year lifespan for every star in the night sky, the time it takes for their light to reach Earth is only a minuscule fraction of their total existence, around 0.002%. This translates to a mere 18% probability that even one of the 9,000 visible stars has already perished. Of course, this line of reasoning applies only to the stars visible to the naked eye in the night sky. When we consider all the stars observed by powerful telescopes, many of those have indeed reached the end of their life cycles. This is likely the source of the confusion, leading to the commonly held belief about the night sky. But, for the stars we can see with our own eyes, the chances of any of them having died off are extremely low. We'll come back to this in a moment. Now, to fully grasp the significance of Brian Cox's recent revelation, we must first address a common misconception. This misconception arises largely from imprecise explanations provided by literature and science communicators. The universe is believed to encompass everything, excluding any potential multiverse. Thus, the assumption whenever one discusses the universe is that it refers to the entirety of the cosmic domain. However, there are actually different ways we can define the universe. These include the observable universe, the causal universe, and the entire universe. Most information learned about the universe pertains to the observable universe, though a distinction is rarely articulated. The observable universe, as the name suggests, is the part of the universe that we can directly observe. This extends 46.1 billion light years from Earth in all directions, but the term is somewhat misleading. Consider the example of Galaxy Glass Z12, the farthest galaxy currently observed, located approximately 33 billion light-years away from Earth. Yet, due to the accelerating expansion of the universe, light emitted from that galaxy today will never reach our planet. We can only observe the light it emitted 13.6 billion years ago, which has finally reached us. Thus, it's considered part of the observable universe, even though its current location lies beyond our view. Beyond the observable universe is the causal universe, the region of space-time that could theoretically have a causal relationship with us on Earth, 
as photons from that distance could potentially reach our planet. This can be thought of as the upper bound of the observable universe. As technology advances and telescopes become more powerful, the observable universe expands. It's believed that future technological breakthroughs will allow us to see even further, yet the causal universe represents the maximum extent the observable universe can ever reach, no matter how much our capabilities improve. However, beyond both the observable and causal universes lies the entire universe, which we assume exists even though we cannot directly confirm it. All of our best cosmological models suggest that the universe extends well beyond what we can observe, likely to infinity. As such, it's presumed that our infinite universe has no actual center, even though visualizations often depict Earth at the center of the observable universe. This is one of the major differences that distinguish the observable universe from the entire cosmic domain, a distinction that's often misunderstood or poorly communicated. Of course, one could argue that this assumption about the lack of a cosmic center is itself another misconception. After all, all the observable scientific data indicates that Earth is indeed the center of the universe we can see. This view is based on the fact that we can observe the same distance in all directions, and the sphere around Earth comprises the observable universe. The shift from geocentric to heliocentric models of the solar system led scientists to adopt the default stance that Earth is an average, unremarkable planet. This perspective remains the default for scientists and for good reason. However, there's no actual evidence that this assumption is true. It's simply an inference based on sound logic and extrapolation. Similarly, the assumption that the entire universe is either infinite or a massive closed shape, with Earth not located in any special position within it, is also based on logical reasoning rather than direct observation. While these assumptions are likely accurate, the currently available physical evidence does not conclusively rule out the possibility that Earth is, in fact, the true center of the universe. Our knowledge of the cosmos has expanded substantially over the previous century. However, every answer uncovered appears to spawn countless novel questions that we have no idea how to address. Brian Cox explains that we have a tool called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which maps the positions of galaxies across the sky. This allows us to determine how much of the sky has been surveyed and how many galaxies have been counted. By extrapolating this data across the wider universe, we can get a picture of a vast and possibly infinite universe. Cox notes that while we know the universe is much larger than the portion we can directly observe, whether it is truly infinite is another question. We can measure the age of the universe by tracing the expansion of galaxies back in time, and this indicates the universe began around 13.8 billion years ago. However, Cox clarifies that what we really know is that the universe was in a very hot and dense state at the time, rather than the universe having an absolute beginning. There are even theories that the universe may have existed in some form before that, suggesting the possibility of an eternal universe. Some people find the idea of an eternal universe more unsettling than the notion of a universe with a defined beginning. The universe is vast, but it's only with recent advancements that we can comprehend how unimaginably immense the universe or even multiple universes may actually be. Eternal chaotic inflation, which generates multiple universes, builds upon the theory of cosmic inflation. Although inflation is generally eternal into the future, it's not eternal into the past. Alan Guth detailed this in a paper published in 2007, noting that new inflation does not produce a perfectly symmetric universe due to quantum fluctuations during inflation. These fluctuations may cause the energy and matter density to be different at various points in space. Quantum fluctuations in the hypothetical inflation field produce changes in the rate of expansion that are responsible for eternal inflation. Those regions with a higher rate of inflation expand faster and dominate the universe, despite the natural tendency of inflation to end in other regions. This allows inflation to continue indefinitely. Modern physics has dramatically transformed our understanding of the cosmic cosmos, offering not only glimpses of the universe's potential future, 
but also providing insights into the overall shape of the universe itself. Brian Cox explains that from the theory of inflation, the best way to explain the observable properties of the universe is that it's vastly larger than the portion we can directly observe. For example, we've measured the geometry of space to be flat, like a tabletop, rather than curved like a sphere or saddle. According to Einstein's theory of general relativity, the curvature of space is determined by the matter and energy content within it. What we find is that there's precisely the right amount of stuff in the observable universe to result in a completely flat geometry. The most favored explanation for this unusual flatness is that the universe is much bigger than the region we can see. The theory of cosmic inflation suggests the universe expanded exponentially in the earliest moments after the Big Bang, creating a vast expanse far beyond our observable horizon. This indicates the observable universe is merely a small fraction of the full cosmic expanse, which may extend infinitely. The flatness we measure is thus a consequence of this larger-than-observable universe, rather than being a fundamental property of the cosmos as a whole. Because we cannot detect space beyond the edge of the observable universe, it remains unknown whether the total size of the universe is finite or infinite. Estimates suggest that the entire universe, if finite, must be over 250 times larger than the observable universe. Astronomers calculate the age of the universe by assuming the Lambda CDM model, accurately describing the evolution of the universe from a very uniform, hot, and dense primordial state to its present state, and by measuring the cosmological parameters that constitute the model over time. The universe and its contents have evolved. For example, the relative population of quasars and galaxies has changed, and space itself has expanded due to this expansion. Scientists on Earth can observe the light from a galaxy 30 billion light-years away, even though that light has traveled for only 13 billion years. The energy from the Big Bang drove the universe's early expansion, and since then gravity and dark energy have engaged in a cosmic tug-of-war, with gravity pulling galaxies closer together and dark energy pushing them apart. Whether the universe is expanding or contracting depends on which force dominates, gravity or dark energy. Besides dark energy, there's also a mysterious, invisible substance that fills the universe which no one's ever directly observed. This hypothetical form of matter, thought to account for approximately 85% of the matter in the universe, is also known as dark matter, but we have yet to fully understand its nature. We may never have a definitive answer to the question of whether the universe is infinite or has an actual boundary. However, what we do know is that the observable universe is stupendously large in volume. This vast expanse of space is estimated to contain anywhere from 200 billion to a trillion galaxies, according to varying estimates, and each galaxy has an average of about 100 billion stars. These gargantuan numbers are both mind-boggling and awe-inspiring when we look into the night sky and try to comprehend the unimaginable scale of the universe. What's the deal with dark matters and aliens? Hopefully this doesn't surprise you, but the cosmos is composed of matter. The three subatomic particles most individuals learn about are negatively charged electrons, positively charged protons, and neutral neutrons. However, those are only the subatomic particles of matter. There are also antimatter particles positrons, antiprotons, and antineutrons. These three particles are identical to their matter counterparts, except they have the opposite charge. Additionally, there are some other characteristics that are reversed as well, but the charge is a significant one. When matter and antimatter come into contact with one another, they're instantly destroyed and transformed into energy. Given the volatile nature of matter and antimatter, they obviously cannot coexist, so it makes sense that the universe would be made up entirely of matter, right? Well, actually, it doesn't make any sense that the universe exists at all. According to the Big Bang Theory, an equal amount of both matter and antimatter would have been created. And as these particles came into contact with one another, they would have been destroyed and turned into energy, meaning no stars, no planets, no nothing. 
Now, obviously, that didn't happen, and here we all are. But the question is, why? Why wasn't all matter and antimatter destroyed, and why did matter prevail? Well, according to the standard model, the prevailing theory in particle physics, there's no reason anything should exist, which means our understanding of physics is just nowhere near complete. Until the 1960s, it was believed that matter and antimatter were symmetrical in every way, with a negative charge in the matter being a positive charge in the antimatter equivalent. But the absolute values of all things pertaining to these particles were always thought to be identical. However, in 1964, researchers discovered a tiny discrepancy in the way that K ions and anti K ions decayed, and some other discrepancies have been found as well. But we cannot emphasize enough just how minute these variations are. Nothing's been discovered in these discrepancies that would violate the standard model, and certainly not to the extent it would provide an explanation for why the universe is comprised solely of matter. There are some proposed modifications to the standard model that hope to fill in some of the gaps in our understanding, like the most prominent proposal, supersymmetry. With any luck, the new and improved Large Hadron Collider can help fill some of the holes in our knowledge of certain atomic particles. According to scientific fake lore, Enrico Fermi, the creator of the first nuclear reactor, was discussing UFO reports with his fellow physicists while strolling to lunch. They were all unsurprisingly cynical, believing that none of the reports of UFOs were genuine. However, Fermi suddenly exclaimed, Where is everybody? Which the others immediately understood to mean extraterrestrial beings. The flip side of this is there are loads of planets out there. And there's been loads of time. This, this has got a name, actually. It's called the Fermi Paradox, after someone called Enrico Fermi, a great Italian physicist who asked this very simple question, which is, where are they? Because given the number of planets, given the number of stars, and given the amount of time in this galaxy for complex life to emerge, it seems as if at least a few civilizations should have become a spacefaring civilization. So part of the evidence, part of the great conundrum here, is that, so on, on the one side, yes, we've got the history of life on Earth, which says that we took a long time to emerge. And so it looked quite like an unlikely process. On the other side, you've got all this real estate. And you have this, so if you think about where we could go, what could we become as a civilization? So already we are becoming a spacefaring civilization now very quickly. So give us a thousand years. We don't destroy ourselves or do anything stupid. We're, I'm sure we're going to be on Mars. We're going to be on the moon. We're going to be thinking, perhaps, taking our first steps out to the stars. Give us a million years, one million from now. If we survive, we should become a spacefaring civilization. Now, one million years, the galaxy has been around for the age of the universe, 12, 13 billion years. So it only takes a few civilizations to have evolved a bit ahead of us. A million years, well, let's say a billion years, a billion years, it's still nothing. You get some civilizations that evolved a billion years before us. Why can't we see them? So then people start saying, well, maybe there's a finite life that all civilizations have. Maybe they destroy themselves. Maybe they don't become spacefaring civilization. The paradox stems from the lack of evidence of any extraterrestrial existence, in contrast to the high estimates for the probability that existence should thrive on other celestial bodies. To try and find a more concrete solution to this enigma, astronomer and astrophysicist Frank Drake proposed the Drake Equation in 1961, aiming to quantify the number of alien civilizations that should thrive. The Drake Equation calculates the number of civilizations that should thrive by multiplying seven factors together. The rate of formation of stars in the galaxy. The fraction of those stars with planetary systems. The number of planets per solar system with an environment suitable for organic existence. The fraction of those planets where organic existence actually emerges. The fraction of habitable planets where intelligent existence actually emerges the fraction of civilizations that reach the technological level where they can dispatch detectable signals, and the length of time those civilizations dispatch their signals. However, the last four factors are completely unknown. While we've discovered many planets suitable for organic existence, 
we have yet to find any actual organic existence. As such, all we can do is speculate about those last four factors. Optimists have used the Drake equation to assert that there should be anywhere from 1,000 to 1 million civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy alone, while pessimists have used it to claim that the number of civilizations per galaxy should be less than one. The mediocrity principle suggests that if an item is chosen at random from a set of objects, the random item is most likely going to be an average example. In this case, the set of objects in celestial bodies that are suitable for existence and the item randomly chosen is Earth. Logically, our planet should be average amongst all potentially habitable celestial bodies. So why have we detected no signs of existence anywhere in the universe? There are several hypothetical explanations for Fermi's paradox. One is the rare Earth hypothesis, which rejects the mediocrity principle and argues that Earth is uniquely special and that the conditions required for existence to evolve are exceedingly rare. Another proposal is that even if complex existence is extremely common, intelligent existence may not be. Earth has had five mass extinction events, and if existence previously existed on other celestial bodies, there's no reason to believe that they could not have been subject to such global catastrophes. Homo sapiens have only existed for about 300,000 years, and the oldest human ancestors were only 2.5 million years ago, which is a relatively short time compared to the 3.7 billion years of existence on Earth, or the 13.8 billion years the universe has existed. It's possible that other intelligent existence has existed in relative proximity to Earth and we just missed it by a billion years or so. There are a lot of possible explanations for why we haven't detected any intelligent existence, but it's also a numbers game. In the Milky Way galaxy alone, there are anywhere from 300 million to 6 billion Earth-like celestial bodies, and there are as many as 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Even if the odds of existence forming on an Earth-like celestial body were a quadrillionth, that would still mean over a billion celestial bodies across the universe should be home to intelligent existence. Our quest to understand the universe is endless, a boundless pursuit that's captivated humanity for centuries. As we venture deeper into the mysteries of the cosmos, each new discovery only serves to lead us further down the rabbit hole of inquiry. So, see ya in the next video. Thanks for watching.